Okay, so we're going to continue on with uh, protists, and um, I'm going to be focusing here on more of the photosynthetic uh, protists, um, the ones that are, say, plant-like, that they sometimes say, uh, and that's because that's our destination uh, in the near future. We're heading toward plants, uh, kingdom plantae, and then going through the, the plant groups. And so, like I said, the, the protists are kind of organizationally all over the place. Uh, and so I've chosen just to kind of pick some of them that are kind of leading us to plants uh, to look at now. We will come back and actually look at some of them later on uh, in the course uh, as we talk about fungi and as we talk about animals. Uh, so we'll talk about um, like cone of say later on. I'm not going to talk about them actually right now. Um, there's some information previously on them, but you'll get that. Uh, in my course, there's also a couple uh, slideshows uh, in the course website. So it kind of goes through a lot of the things that I'm talking about here. Um, and, and again, I'm just going to be pointing some of those things out now. So you have me actually talking about some of the uh, terms uh, and adding in some details of, of things that I think you should um, pay more attention to. So these are some of the groups uh, and I'll, I'll break them up uh, as we kind of go along. All right. Uh, I'll talk about some of these pictures a little bit. So Euglenozoa. Okay, that is one of the uh, protease groups. Um, they are typically green if they are uh, photosynthetic. Uh, and so what we do, we do have members of this group that are photosynthetic. Uh, heterotrophic. So heterotrophic, phototrophic, mixotrophic. and uh, parasites. So they're single-celled uh, protists and parasites that belong uh, to this group. Uh, so uh, those that are photosynthetic are typically green, but they're not the green algae. Um, green algae are actually going to be down here. That's these guys. Um, so these are the green algae. Now, something to point out uh, traditionally the way many of the algae have been broken down in the protists have been by color um, of the pigments, of the photosynthetic pigments. So we essentially, and, we, and some of them still kind of follow along that pattern. So we do have um, so the, the golden or golden brown uh, algae, which we'll talk about those. Um, they have some pigments called carotenoids. Um, the brown algae as their own group. The red algae is their own group, and then the green algae is their own group. But then we do see some of the others um, that are photosynthetic. Um, they don't necessarily belong to one of those groups. They just do. They just do their own thing. Uh, so that's your glenozoa. Now, the the dinoflagellates uh, and diatoms they can kind of be put together here. Um, dinoflagellates they are also going to be uh, photosynthetic, but they're typically not green, uh, to seem to be uh, more, more brown pigments. Uh, they're heterotrophic and mixotrophic, but we typically don't see parasites uh, that are dinoflagellates. Dinoflagellates are interesting uh, in their structure. So this is part of the, the dinoflagellate structure. This is not a dinoflagellate, that's a diatom, which would be like the next guy here. Um, the dinoflagellate uh, tends to have, look something like this. Uh, a little spinning top sort of structure. And what's interesting about it <coughs> is that typically two flagella, and you glenozoa typically have two flagella. So two flagella. And a flagella typically have two flagella. <coughs> One of these flagella, stick off them like this. The other flagella actually wraps around the circumference right of the the cell and then the cell has these two uh, cellulose plates kind of make up a cell wall surrounding the the cell um, and they often have these little spike-like structures and, and they gives them this unique sort of look. Um, so again, these are single-celled organisms. These are single-celled organisms. So you clean zoa single-celled, dinoflagellate single-celled, um, aquatic organisms. So we find them uh, in fresh and salt water, a variety of uh, 
different types. Some of them, thinoflagellates, tend to be more marine in salt waters. Euglenozoa tend to be more in fresh water, but we do see mixtures. Of, we do see them in a variety of different places. The diatoms are unique. Uh, so then most of these are photosynthetic. And they have, this is the diatom now over here. As an example, just uh, just uh, some one random uh, shaped one that I, that I picked out. The thing is, the pattern that you're seeing is the pattern of a structure called a theca, which is a silicon dioxide shell they sort of create for themselves. And that's sort of what makes the, the diatoms unique, <clears throat> is that they have this um, silicon dioxide shell. Another very important thing about the diatoms is that in the Earth's oceans, uh, so they're uh, marine, and in the oceans, they carry out a lot of photosynthesis in uh, open water, in the oceans. And as a result, they're pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere. So carbon fixation, we taught this uh, in one of the last lectures, carbon fixation. What happens is that uh, many of these diatoms will then die. The organic parts of them are trapped within this little shell. The organism then sinks very deep to the bottom of the ocean. And so essentially, while they're alive, they're sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. But when they die, that carbon dioxide does not get immediately recycled and put back into the atmosphere. It actually gets sucked out, kind of pulled down deep into the ocean. And often it goes past areas where there are certain decomposers. And so it isn't broken down often for a very long time uh, and released. So they are very important for actually removing car excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And so disturbances to the oceans that harm these diatoms really can harm the atmosphere of the entire planet. Uh, so just something to keep in mind how things are connected um, that you wouldn't normally think you know, are, are connected. In addition to that, um, diatoms can get washed up you know, onto beaches uh, and then form sort of the sand you know, uh, that are that's essentially the composition of the sand that is along some of the beaches and then some of the organics that are part of them can get sucked up in storms right and, and kind of get blown across even from one continent you know to another continent so um diatoms from the shores of africa can get blown across the ocean to south america and fertilize tropical rainforests uh in south america uh and they're actually the the carbon from the atmosphere kind of getting circulated all the way around, but transported in a variety of different ways. Um, it's very complex. And that's again, it's not our class, it's a whole separate thing, but just trying to emphasize some of the roles that some of these organisms play are um, much greater than you might think. So uh, people write them off as being just some uh, single celled organism, doesn't really do anything much, but they actually are incredibly important uh, to us. Um, some of them are, like I said, some of them are parasitic and, and disease causing as well. Some of the dinoflagellates can, uh, are, said, are important, but others can cause red tide or sort of blooms that can create a toxin. And that toxin can kill fish and a variety of marine invertebrates. And if people consume those organisms, they can become also very ill. So they can have uh, some, ne some of those sort of negative effects as well. Golden algae, um, they can, uh, they can be single celled or some multi celled. Uh, they contain carotenoids, uh, so they can be, look more yellow, orange in color, uh, and they are really their their own sort of group uh, on their own based on the the different pigment type. But the brown algae is the one that I'll spend a little more time uh, talking about because the brown algae uh, is composed of a, a number of single and multicellular algae. Uh, and so things that people often refer to as seaweed are many times brown algae. I mean, there's green algae that are, that are seaweed too, and there's some and red algae as well, but these are just very, very common organisms. In addition to just being common, 
Uh, we also see now some of the, the greatest um, differences in size here. So some of our, our largest um, algae belong to this group. So that, that includes uh, giant kelp. So kelp are multicellular algae uh, and they can be meters, many meters. Uh, they can be like 100 feet in, in length or more. Uh, so it's like that's like 30 meters but up to 50 meters in, in length um, from base to tip as a multicellular organism. So these are still considered part of this protista group, um, which we said is, isn't really a true kingdom or a phyla or anything. It's just a, a grouping of these organisms that aren't plant. There's not a plant. Um, and so we'll talk about some of the structures. So the brown algae right, have a structure called, it's not, they don't have roots. So that's first off. So why aren't they, why aren't they plants? Because they, they're multicellular and they're photosynthetic. Plants, we're going to get into them, then that'll be like our next big topic. I'll spend the whole rest of the, the time for this, the, third, the second exam all just on plants. Um, plants, some of them are non-vascular, but then we'll get into vascular structures and, and seed producers and all these different sorts of things. And, and these don't really have any of these kinds of structures. They're, they do their own sort of different thing. Um, so they don't have a root system. They're not obtaining nutrients in that way. They're obtaining nutrients directly through the water, through the, the, the body wall. Um, this structure though here that looks like a root is called a holdfast. Holdfast is important because it, it anchors, so essentially it's the anchor the organism to the bottom of the ocean. Uh, and that's sort of where the, the new young, we'll talk about the, a little bit about the reproduction as well, um, the young organisms uh, will start to settle, attach, all right, and then divide, and then the cell division takes place, then they start to grow this, what, what would be a stem, uh, in plants, but because it's technically not a plant, we don't call it a stem, we call it a stipe. And so the stipe is the thing that can then be many, many, many meters right, in length. It may have branching, which again, they don't have leaves. All right, we'll talk about the, the structures that come off of them are blades. And the blades are photosynthetic, like the leaves are the photosynthetic organ of a uh, plant, the blades are photosynthetic, but other parts of the stipe can be photosynthetic too, but uh, these, are, these are sort of the main photosynthetic areas. In addition to that, many of the algae will have sort of a gas bladder, a structure of their body wall that then has gas accumulated in it and then it swells, um, uh, and then it is called uh, a um, nematocyst. Now, pneumo for air, nematocyst, this structure. So that is their float, essentially. It allows them to, to float in the water, which is essentially they're anchored to the bottom here, and then this lifts them up. So then, and as the current moves and they kind of sway in the water, the reason they don't just like lie on the bottom flat is because they have these little structures in them that hold them up. Uh, and so this particular one I drew here, uh, something more like a fucus uh, as opposed to a kelp, it's just a, a type of brown algae. Um, and you know, they can be many centimeters you know, in length. Uh, let's just say, for example, you know, by a size comparison, the two drawings I have here, this might be up to 50 centimeters in length, and this is only 100 micrometers. So this is a tiny single cell here we're talking about for this diatom, but this is a very large structure which you know, can, uh, can range in size depending on the, the particular species. They can be really big. Something else we're going to talk about here for an extra uh, bit about brown algae is that we start to see some interesting things with their reproduction that we don't often see in some in the other groups, although some of them do some odd or interesting things. Um, if you were to go into it in more detail, you'll see in some of the slideshows, some of them, for example, um, are multinucleate. So that's something about proteins. Not all proteins are multinucleate, but many are. What that means is that they have uh, karyokinesis without cytokinesis, or essentially the nucleus divides. So here's a cell. This is the cell's nucleus. The cell undergoes nuclear division. The DNA doubles. The chromosomes are pulled apart. You have two chromosomes. Typically, after that happens, then there is cytokinesis. The cell then divides into two halves, and then you have two new cells. 
except in many cases with a lot of proteins, we don't see that. And we have a uh, cell with two nuclei. So some of them stay like that and they actually have two nuclei. Others can have multiple nuclei. And so some of them, uh, even some of these algae, even like some of these green algae down here, um, they have multinucleate form. So essentially it looks like, almost like a fern-like green plant. It's not, it's, it's algae. Um, but it's actually a single cell in the sense that there are no divisions between the cells because the nuclei divide and then the structure just gets larger. So we see a lot of just odd sort of variations of these things. And we also see uh, in terms of mating, some of the organisms where they have, for example, um, these two different nuclei and then one of the nuclei can undergo not both of them, but one of them would undergo meiosis and then produce a haploid nucleus. Uh, and then these two cells can actually connect to one another and then trade uh, essentially haploid nuclei. So this is might be a little reminiscent if you um, were studying in the bacteria. So prokaryotes, not eukaryotes conjugation. So it's, it's a totally different thing, yet in some ways there are similarities. So what is that? What am I talking about? Conjugation is where two bacterial cells come together with a pilus. So a structure is produced by one bacterial cell. It extends and then connects the cytoplasm of one cell to another. And then through that little tube that's connecting the cells, the pilus, DNA, a circular piece of DNA as a plasmid is pushed from one cell to the other. And that's a whole separate process called conjugation, which uh, you'll look at separately. Um, and this is not that process, but it's similar. It has certain structures where the, the two cells come together, they kind of join, and then they exchange genetic information. Right? And that's separate from the nucleus. So it's also like conjugation in bacteria. They actually, the genome of the bacteria is not involved in that process. It's separate. It's right? something else. So things like this happen where it is a type of genetic exchange to increase genetic diversity. Well, now brown algae have something that they do, which is kind of interesting, in that they'll form multicellular, they're often multicellular, and they have multicellular, we call alternation of generation. So essentially there's a generation of the organism that is multicellular, but all the cells are haploid. So we have a haploid multicellular version of the organism called a gametophyte. And we'll get into this actually a lot more with a lot more detail as we go over plant life cycles because uh, many of the plant life cycles have this gametophyte sporophyte um, generation, which we'll get into, get into again in much more detail uh, in the future. So these are just the introduction to the concepts and some of the terms. Uh, and then we have diploid, also multicellular, sporophyte. Sporophyte, P-H-Y-T-E, and that's cellular, multicellular, okay. So, a multicellular organism, a multicellular organism. So this could look like a little a branching thing, except this is generally microscopic, tiny. Uh, and then this is multicellular, and this could be the branching, you know, something like this as well, uh, but, it's, but it could be large. You know, so the cells here of this multicellular organism are haploids. They're all 1N cells, whereas these cells are all 2N cells. This one undergoes mitosis. This one undergoes meiosis. So it can actually undergo meiosis and produce these spores and the spores will settle. Uh, or the spores can then fuse with others to, um, well, it'll make the, the haploid version and we'll go through the whole process again later on without confusing you. So just right now, go over the terms. Uh, haploid is a single uh, sets of chromosomes, a diploid where we have double the sets of chromosomes, um, and we have gametophyte and sporophyte as these two terms. And so the brown algae are one of the first groups that we see that really displays this um, 
called alternation of generations, where it's the same organism, but it has one generation. There's this smaller, microscopic, haploid, multicellular organism, uh, and then it under then it changes, and then it undergoes a process of fusion, so they form the two end cells, and then they form the diploid organism, and then they eventually go back and forth, and so it forms like a big you know, cycle, which will start to go over life cycles, but we're not doing... I don't want to do that right now. I just want to introduce the, the terms. It's a whole whole lecture separate uh, in itself. But this is just a time to introduce some of these things. So uh, that's all we're going to say about the brown algae for now. Uh, red algae are their own unique group, but the red algae now start to become, you know, sometimes they're in a, a sort of a overarching group where they're kind of in a bigger group, kind of put together with the green algae. So they're very closely related. Um, but then they're separate. They're, they're pulled out because of their um, photosynthetic pigments. Um, they typically lack flagella. So something else to take, sort of take, take note of about what makes one group unique or different than another group and how they compare. Uh, and, and a lot of these are multicellular. Uh, other t types of marine, you know, algae that we see, but the, but we do see uh, freshwater red algae, and there's even some that are uh, in kind of moist terrestrial environments that are that are red algae. So now we get we're not going to talk about plants, but that's kind of where we're getting to. So then we talk, we get into the the chlorophytes and the caryophytes. So the the, the chlorophytes are um, mostly uh, freshwater. Um, there are some freshwater single-celled groups, uh, and then um, some of the marine ones that are multicellular sometimes there's a, a type of algae, a green algae called sea lettuce. Uh, it's not really lettuce, but it's uh, genus is Ova. It's very common. Uh, that you can see it's important for um, it's a food source for a variety of marine fish uh, and a number of invertebrates um, and it is it belongs to this group, the chlorophytes. Now the caryophytes, what is unique about them is that they're chloroplast it is pretty much the same as the chloroplast structure that we see in our kingdom plantae on all of our land plants, right? Although they're still uh, considered algae, um, they can live in, obviously they're aquatic, but some of them can be found in just sort of very wet habitats as well. And that's the thing we're going to find with plants that you may be um, not familiar with, is that as we start to talk about some of the very first groups of plants, we're going to find that they actually have uh, swimming sperm that require water so that the plants cannot undergo sexual reproduction and fertilization without the sperm swimming in water. And that's necessary really for uh, mosses and ferns, the bryophytes and the, the pteraphytes that we'll talk about. Um, they, they require that. So we kind of have that link between the aquatic green algae and then eventually as they start to become what we're going to classify as the plants, um, there's still that aquatic link. And it's something you will find as well in, in other groups of organisms like um, amphibians. So fish required to live in water. They don't live on land. They have gills and they don't have lungs. But then amphibians, which are kind of on the end, amphibians have gills uh, as they swim around in the water when they are, are larvae, but then they undergo a metamorphosis um, and then they develop lungs and they can move up onto the land. And so we can actually have some groups that actually display both characteristics. And that's kind of where we are with the, with the algae and the plants is we're kind of, this is now at that bridge between characteristics that are aquatic and then characteristics that start to become terrestrial, which is a, a separate lecture. We'll get into on those as well, but uh, just to give you kind of heads up on, you know, kind of where we're going with this, that's going to be a, a major topic. So this isn't really a topic. Um, this is just sort of a tour of the names of some of the groups and some of the characteristics of some of those which you will find organized um, into some of the slides uh, in our course. Um, 
but I'm just sort of pointing out a few of the main ones that you're more likely to be asked about, so you should kind of look into those even a little bit more as you read uh, outside of the lectures.